Let's open the Word of God together. Where would you like to go tonight, church? You tell me. Where would you like to go? (laughs) Okay. Well, let's go to 2 Corinthians then. What chapter would you like to go to? Chapter 13. What verse would you like to study together? Well, good. Well, that's where we'll go then. 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 14. Some of you are just joining us saying, what kind of preacher is this? He lets the congregation choose the text. No. We've decided we're just going to live in this verse this week and pray the Holy Spirit will make it live in us. And uh, we began here yesterday, and we continue here tonight. We'll conclude here tomorrow night. One verse. Isn't it amazing how much truth the Holy Spirit can put in one verse? And what a verse it is. It is a verse that very commonly gets used at the end of meetings. But I want to say to you, this is not just a good ending verse. This is a new beginning verse. I think it's one of the great revival verses of the Bible. It is the last thing penned by the Holy Spirit through Paul to the church at Corinth. Would you look at it with me? 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 14. Let's read it aloud. Ready? The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. Let's try it again. Ready? The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. I must tell you that the longer I live and the more I serve the Lord, the more convinced I am that the thing that has been lost is the simplicity of God's truth. We live in a complicated world, and frankly, uh, we Christians can make things pretty complex ourselves. But the Lord brings us back to the most simple things. His powerful truth wrapped in simplicity. Sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? And what a simple verse this is. You see in it the triune God. Don't miss it, please. You have Christ, that's the Son. You have God, that's the Father. And you have the Holy Ghost, who we'll come to tomorrow night, the third person of the Godhead. And somebody says, explain this to me, preacher. Explain the triune God to me. I can't explain it to you. There are some things that no mortal man could explain. You must simply accept by faith what God gives in His Word. All I know is there is one God expressed in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, co-equal, co-existent, co-eternal, the thrice holy God, and I think God's people ought to get to know the Godhead. What do you think? I've heard all the illustrations. People use water to illustrate, you know, the three forms, and they use an egg. You ever hear somebody use an egg to try to demonstrate? Let me just tell you, there is nothing, nothing that you can use to illustrate a God that is greater than all. And if you want to use an illustration, use a Bible illustration. There's only one thing in Scripture that really demonstrates or illustrates the Godhead and their perfect love and fellowship and communion, and it is this beautiful picture of family. We refer to God as God the what? Father. And the Lord Jesus Christ is God the? Right. And then you have God the Holy Spirit. And so listen to me, please. If you want to understand the Godhead, think of our God as the the perfect family in unbroken union and communion from eternity past. And then, let me really blow your mind. God Almighty made a way so that you could come into His own family. And you'll never be God. Oh, no, my friend, there's only one God. But God made a way so that fallen humanity could know God personally. And instead of Him being a God a million miles away, seated somewhere off in the universe, Uh, totally untouched by our our feelings and infirmities. God became a man without ever ceasing to be God. That's why Jesus came to earth. (laughs) Aren't you glad that the divine pierced right through the veil into humanity? The Bible says the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. Literally, He pitched His tent next door to ours. So He's not a God far off. He's a God very near. And so that's why. That's why. Look at the verse again. You have all three members of the Godhead, but He begins with a son. Why does it begin with the Son? Because apart from Jesus, you can't know God. The truth is in Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And the Lord Jesus is the one that brings the great need to all of us. And what is it? Look at verse verse 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you are glad for fresh grace today? Are you glad for that? Matter of fact, let me just show you something just for fun, just for fun, all right? Won't be long, quick detour. How many of you give me 60 seconds? Would you raise your hand, 60 seconds? Good, that's at least 20 or 30 minutes right there. That's good. Go back with me to Romans just for a second. Just flip back. Now, hold your place. We're coming right back. 
But go back to the book of Romans, to the last thing Paul wrote to the church at Rome. And notice, it's interesting to me, that when he comes to the end of these Spirit-inspired letters, he always comes back to grace, to grace, to grace. Not what he could do for them, and not what they could do for God, but what only God could ever do for man. Look at Romans 16, verse number 20. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Let me stop right there and say, praise God for that promise. Look, let me tell you who the devil is. He's the old serpent. Do you remember way back in the book of Genesis, what did God say? God promised, first promise of the Messiah, Genesis chapter 3, verse number 15, that the Lord Jesus Christ, the seed of the woman, would come and he would bruise the head of the seed of the serpent. Do you remember that promise in Genesis 3, 15? That happened when our Lord Jesus Christ came, when he died on the cross, was buried, rose again from the dead. When he came out of that grave alive forevermore, I'm glad to report to you on the authority of the word of God, he put his nail-pierced foot squarely on the head of that old serpent, the devil. Satan is already a defeated foe. At this moment, our ascended Christ, seated at the right hand of the Heavenly Father, is already the victor. Look, he's not going to be the victor. He is the victor now, and if you know him as your Savior, you're on the winning side. Aren't you glad about that? But at this moment, the devil's still giving us fits. How many of you had the devil give you fits lately? Would you raise your hand? Well, the Bible says, as surely, look at the verse again, as surely as God has bruised Satan under Christ's feet, there's coming a day. Look at that. If I didn't know this in the Bible, I wouldn't preach it. That the God of peace will bruise Satan under your feet. Watch. Do you see the war and the peace in the same verse? Someday the war is going to end. Well, how's that going to happen? Someday, watch please. The only way Satan could be bruised under our feet is that we have to be seated with the Lord Jesus Christ. So someday real soon, we're going to be with the Lord Jesus. And on that day, the devil's not going to give you fits anymore. The devil is going to be shut up for all eternity. Isn't that going to be a glorious day? Somebody said, Preacher, when's that going to happen? Well, let me give you a Bible word. Would you like me to give you a Bible word? If anybody tells you they know when Jesus is coming, get as far away from them as you possibly can. Because no man knows the day or the hour. But here's the word. He'll do it. What's that word? One word. Shortly. I remember as a boy on vacation with my parents. You know, kids always want to know, when are we going to be there? How much longer? And Dad never would tell me. He always gave me a one-word answer. I hated that answer. He would say, shortly, son, shortly. We'll be there shortly. I didn't like it because it wasn't a definite time, but it was a definite promise. Our Lord hasn't given us the time, but he has given us his word on it. Christ is coming shortly, and victory will be ours shortly. But don't miss the last part of the verse. That's why I brought you here. Because Romans 16, verse number 20, not only gives you something to look forward to, it gives you something for the here and now. After saying, the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly, he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And all God's people said, amen. Watch this, please. We have much to look forward to, but until that day comes, we have the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ with us right now. Our God is not a future tense God, and he's not a past tense God. If you don't believe me, read his name in Scripture. He is the I am. He is a present tense God. And so the Lord Jesus Christ brings all the grace of God to bear in our lives. Let's go back to our verse, and let me show you the second part tonight. Three beautiful parts. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 14. We began with the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, a son's grace. But then we come to the Father. And, <laughs> and I want to say, praise God for the end. And the love of God. And I know, I know what you're thinking. Oh, preacher, we, we already know about the love of God. Do you? How well do you know it? You know, it's really tragic. <clears throat> we have almost treated, Pastor, the love of God like it is entry-level Christianity. And so we teach the children, seeing Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tell me, tells me so. And we deal with people that don't know God at all. We begin with, for God so loved the world, and that's a great starting point. But then it's almost like people come to know the Lord, and then they're like, well, I got that figured out already. I, I already know the love of God. Listen to me, church, for just a second. There is no end to the love of God. In fact, whatever it is you think you know to this point, you don't know anything like God wants you to know. I've heard preachers preach that when we get to heaven, you're going to know everything. That is not in the Bible. It's not what the Bible teaches. It says we will know even as we are known. And we're going to know much more than we know now. We're going to have much more clarity than we do now because our faith will have become sight. 
But can you imagine how boring it would be to show up in heaven and know everything in one instant and have nothing else to discover? I want you to know God is an infinite God. I'm going to tell you what I believe from Scripture. I believe we're going to spend the rest of eternity forever going, in the words of the hymn writer, deeper and deeper into the love of God. We treat the love of God like it's the kitty end of the pool. You know, it's the shallow end. Come on, come on, kids. Splash around down here in the love of God, and then you mature to, to greater spiritual truths. Listen to me, church. The love of God is not the shallow end of the pool. It's the deep end of the pool. No, excuse me. It's the whole pool. And I'm going to tell you why. Because love is not one part of God. Love is who God is. Twice in 1 John chapter 4, we read this expression, God is love. It's not something he does. Love is the very character and nature of God. If you want to know God, then you must enter into a deeper, fuller understanding of the love of God. Oh, what a thought this is, the creator God of the universe. A God so big, he could speak one word, and it was light, and it was good. It was very good. A God that sustains it all with the word of his power. That God so big would be so loving and kind and personal that he would come near to sinful humanity. And instead of pushing us further away, instead he made a way to draw us near to himself. God could never love you any more than he loves you now and he will never love you any less. There was never a day, think of this church, there was never a day that God didn't love you. He never started loving you. He's always loved you. And there will never be a day he stops loving you. He loves you with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible said. He's the eternal God. His love is eternal. And listen, he loves you exactly like you are. He wrote, he wrote to his children in Deuteronomy, the children of Israel, and he said, you think I loved you because you were the greatest of all the nations? <laughs> they were the smallest God said, I just loved you because I chose to love you. Somebody said, why does God love us? You ready? He can't help himself. God loves you just because. Not because of who you are, not because of what you've done, not because of how much Bible you know, not because of how long you've been in church. He loves you for one reason, not because of you. He loves you because of him. He loves you because our God is the God of all love. And you know what God wants? He wants you to come to a deeper understanding of the love of God for yourself. Here's what's really interesting in this verse. The grace here is connected to the ministry of the Son, and rightly so because he's the one who brought all of God's grace down to us. The, the Father and the Son are very often in Paul's letters always connected. It, he says, from the, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You know why that is? Because, look please, one is the sender and the other is the channel by which it came. So God is the God of all grace, but it comes to us through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you travel back upstream, go ahead, travel back upstream to the watershed, to the fountain, to the source of everything, watch please, it all leads you back to the God, look at the heart of the verse, who is the God of perfect love. And I must tell you, words fail me. And our minds can't, can't fully comprehend this. In fact, in a world of a lot of hate right now, have you ever seen so much harshness in the world as we have at this moment? I mean, seriously, have you ever seen so much strife and envy and contention? People can't get along? This is awful to say, and it's not even just lost people. It's saved people that can't get along anymore. And I just say to you, there's one thing that fixes all that. You know what it is? It's the love of God. I was preaching recently through 1 Corinthians 13. You know that great love chapter? I said, oh, that's, that's a beautiful chapter, Pastor. It's a bloody chapter. It wore me out. Because I started studying through 1 Corinthians 13, and I started seeing all these beautiful aspects of the perfect love of God and realizing how deficient they were in my own life. And suddenly it dawned on me, do you understand that the love of God straightens everything out, that, that everything that's wrong in our lives, in our families, in our churches, in our world, would be straightened out if we had a better understanding of the love of our great God? I'm speaking tonight on this subject. Would you write it down, please? A father's love. It's not just any love. Remember, we're in the family here. This is a family verse, and we've been introduced to the Son. Now we come to the Father. It's a Father's love. Let me show you something really interesting. Hold your place here for just a second, and go back with me to the book of Genesis for just a moment. Find Genesis in your Bible. That's the book of beginnings, of course. Law of first mention. If you can find the first time something is mentioned in Scripture, it's a little key that unlocks the truth. So go with me to Genesis chapter 22. You're going to want to mark this in your Bible. 
This is the first mention of love in the whole Bible. Now, before we read it, let me ask you a question. Does that mean God just started loving in Genesis 22 and there was no love prior to that? Yes or no? Absolutely not. No, the God of the Bible has always been the God of love. I've even heard people preach, well, you know, in the Old Testament, God's a God of law and judgment. Well, there's law and judgment there. There's no doubt about that. And they said, but I like the God of the New Testament, the God of the New Testament. Now, he's a God of love and grace. I think you missed the whole picture here. Because the God of the Bible is not more of one attribute than he is of another, and he's not some at one time and others at another time. No, look, please. He is perfect law, perfect justice, perfect judgment, perfect holiness, perfect love. He's the perfection of all of his attributes. He is the Lord who changes not. But look at Genesis chapter 22 and verse number 1. Here's the context of the first mention of love. See if it sounds familiar. It came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou, what's that word, church? Would you mark it in your Bible? And in the margin of your Bible, you might write a little note to yourself. It's the first mention. This is powerful. The first mention of love in the Bible is a father's love. God's revealing something here, and I'm going to show you that in just a moment. Take your son Isaac, your only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I'll tell thee of. Now, we know the rest of the story, that God provided a ram in the thicket and, and uh, Abraham didn't have to sacrifice his son. But this is one of the greatest pictures of what God the Father did with his son that's found anywhere in the Old Testament. Abraham here is called on to do something in obedience and faith. And what is it? It is to offer his son as a sacrifice to God. And look, look carefully at the verse. Where did he tell him to take him to? There's a, there's a mountain in the land of where? What's the name of that? Moriah. Would you like to know what mountain that is? Would you like to know the geographical location of that? It would be the same spot where the temple would later be built. And more importantly, it would be the same exact spot where the Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, would come and die for our sins. And thousands of years before that moment. By the way, Moriah means where God sees and provides. Anybody glad God sees and provides? And it was at Moriah where a heavenly father offered his own precious son. Why would he do such a thing? Because he's a God of love. Somebody said, I wish you could see love, preacher. You can. You can. Look at the cross. Just look at the cross. I want you to watch as they spit in his face and beat him. Cat of nine tails wraps around his body, and every time they pull it back, it pulls more of the flesh from his bones till eventually his internal organs are exposed. The Bible says his visage was more marred than any man. You've never seen such a, such a horrendous thing done to a human being. Five types of wounds the human body can take. He had all five, all five before it was done. Watch them put a crown of thorns on his head and beat it down into place as the blood trickles down the face of the lovely Son of God, the creator of the world. And they blindfold him and hit him in the face and say, come on, tell us who hit you. You know what all of that is? That's, that's the love of God. So he says, that's the hatefulness of man. No, no, listen to me, please. That's the love of God. They accuse him. They say awful things to him. He answers not a word. You know what that is? That's, that's the love of God. They make him carry a tree that he created. <laughs> he falls under the weight of it as he walks up a mountain. We call it Calvary. It's Mount Moriah, same mountain. And when they get him to the top, they lay him down. They take long spikes and drive them through his hands and his feet. And they lift that tree up into a hole that was dug for it. It drops down into place. And now all of his bones are out of joint. They look and stare at him. Somebody says, this is awful, preacher. Look at it close. That's the love of God. Suddenly it's midnight in the middle of the day as God the Father turns his back on his own son. You know why he turned his back on his son? He turned his back on his son because he was really turning his back on our sin. You see, at that moment, Christ became sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. At that moment, the Son of God took all of the sin of all of humanity and all of the wrath and judgment of Almighty God and suddenly a cry pierces the darkness, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, Why? Hast thou forsaken me? And on this side of the cross, we know the answer to that question. We have 
the beauty of hindsight and retrospect. I'll tell you why God forsook his son. God forsook his son so that you and I could be accepted. He took death so we could take life. He took darkness so we could take light. He took hell so we could take heaven. He took our sins so we could take his righteousness. What a Savior. That's the love of God. And then that victor's cry, not a pitiful cry, victor's cry, to tell us thy, it is finished. It was a merchant term that literally the, all the shopkeepers would have known in the day. If you came in to pay your bill and you paid it in full, they would stamp your receipt with something. It was one word, to tell us thy, paid in full. When Jesus died on the cross, he declared once and for all that the sin debt of all humanity had been paid in full through the blood of the everlasting sacrifice. Now, I'll tell you what that is. That's the love of God. I want you to know, church, that at this moment, what this world needs to see more than any time in history is it needs to see a clear glimpse of the love of our great God. And look, it's not just lost people that need to see it. It's God's people that need to see it again. What love is this? It is a Father's love. By the way, a little interesting side note, this is the first mention of love in the Old Testament. Do you know the first mention of love in the New Testament? Do you know what it is? It's found in the book of Matthew, chapter number 3. We were there last night, hint, hint. A voice from heaven says of the Lord Jesus as he stands in the baptismal water of the Jordan River, say it, this is my beloved son. First mention of love, this is powerful. First mention of love in the New Testament. Here's a father's love yet again. Look, from start to finish, it is the love of the everlasting father for every one of us. And I'm glad to tell you tonight that the same father who loved his son now makes a way so you can be a child of God and experience the love of God for yourself. Frederick Lehman, 1917, was a businessman in California. They went through a financial depression at the time, and Lehman, who was doing extremely well for himself, lost everything. He was a Christian. Thank God you don't lose Jesus. That's good, isn't it? But he lost all of his worldly goods. And this businessman finds himself in a packing factory, packing lemons and oranges in crates. Feeling sorry for himself. Thinking about how far he slid from where he was. On a particular Sunday, he goes to church, sits down, pastor gets up and preaches, and the pastor preached that day on a great subject. Maybe you've heard somebody preach on it before. The love of God. He couldn't get it off his mind. I don't know what text the man used, but that's what he preached on, the love of God. And Frederick Lehman went to went to work that week and one morning as he was walking to the packing plant to create lemons and oranges he started meditating on the love of God and he said by the time he got to work he was just overtaken with it just overcome with it the words started coming to his to his mind he grabbed a pen out of his pocket and started looking for something to write on found a piece of an old crate and a piece of an old piece of paper and he just started writing as fast and furious as he possibly could he wrote some amazing words they're in your hymn book you know you have a hymn book there in front of you? If you have one near you, pull it out just a second. And I'm not going to sing to you so you can relax, all right? It's just one more thing you can praise God for. How about that? It's hymn 108 in your hymn book. I don't know if you're singing around here or not, but if, if you don't, you should. At the bottom of the page, you'll see his name right there. He is Frederick M. Lehman. Here's what he wrote. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God gave his son to win. His erring child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin. I like verse 2. When years of time shall pass away and earthly thrones and kingdoms fall, when men who here refuse to pray on rocks and hills and mountains call, God's love so sure shall still endure, all measureless and strong, redeeming grace to Adam's race, the saints and angels' song. Oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forevermore endure, the saints and angels' song. I think, I think he wrote a pretty good song on orange crate. What do you think? But he had a problem. Because in 1917, all the hymns had three verses. I mean, everybody knows that a preacher's sermon's not completed if it doesn't have three points, and a hymn's not complete if it doesn't have three verses, right? At least that was the mentality. And he didn't have a third verse. 
He couldn't even think of any more words. And then he remembered a poem someone had given him. He dug it out, opened it up to find a little inscription at the bottom. It's an amazing story, true story. Find it for yourself. The poem had been written and found on the wall of a prison cell 200 years before Laman lived. It was 200 years old. It was written by an inmate in a prison, and nobody knows who wrote it, and nobody knows what he was incarcerated for, and nobody knows the circumstances of the writing. All they know is that somebody in that cell wrote that on the wall, and years later they came through painting the inside of this old prison, and one of the men who was doing the work read that poem on the wall and thought it was so powerful. He said, hold it, fellas, and before they painted over, he took out a pen and piece of paper and wrote down the poem, and it survived. Would you like to know that the poem that Frederick Lehman had been handed years before and it had been written 200 years before was a perfect match to what he had just written in the first two verses. It's the third verse in your hymn book. Could we with ink the ocean fill? And were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. Do you understand, church, that there's no end to the love of God? And if there's no end to the love of God, then don't you think one of the greatest hungers of our hearts ought to be that we want to go deeper and deeper into the love of God? Do you, do you remember what he wrote in Ephesians chapter 4? He said that he prayed that the church at Ephesus would, would, be, would be firm in the love of God and that they would begin to know the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of God which passeth knowledge, passeth understanding. Let me ask you a question. How do you know something that passes knowledge? And the answer is, you have to experience it. It means you can't figure this out by your mind. This is not human logic. It doesn't make sense. You can't reason your way through it. You must experience it for yourself. But there is a new dimension to the love of God that every one of us in this room needs to experience. Dear Lord, open our understanding by the Holy Spirit and help us to see more clearly than ever the love of God for sinners. In fact, my study of revival history I discovered something really interesting. Do you know what one of the characteristics of real revival has been through the centuries? Every revival is different. The Welsh revival was marked by great singing, and some revivals are marked by certain preaching, and some revivals like the revival in New York City long ago was a prayer revival. I think there are key elements that are consistent throughout, but they're all unique and all a little different. You can't put God in a box. And I discovered something in my reading. Would you like to know what one of the things that always characterizes a true revival is? In every true spiritual awakening, the people suddenly get awake to the love of God. In fact, excuse me, the religious people wake up to it. The people who have been in church all of their lives, who know that already, who've said it for years and sung the hymns for years, suddenly get a clear glimpse of what a black-hearted, hell-deserving sinner they are and how wonderful it is that God would love them. May I testify tonight? I'm standing here not as a preacher. I'm standing here as a fellow sinner, and I know me. I know me better than you know me, and God knows me better than I know me. And the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And God says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins. Look, God knows every one of us. He looks beneath our religiosity and beneath the cliches and beneath what others think of us, and He knows our deep spiritual need. And you know what He knows? He knows that apart from the love of God, we'd all be lost. And I'll tell you what you need, church. You don't just need a son's grace. You need a father's love. Go back with me to our verse, would you please? And let me give you just two or three very brief thoughts from the verse. Number one, would you write down, first of all, the father's love conquers our hearts. It's a heart word. Love's a heart word. The heart of the Bible, you have books like Psalms and Song of Solomon. They go to the heart. As a matter of fact, notice where the love of God is. It's sandwiched where? Right in the heart of the verse. And what does it do? It reveals the very heart of God. Only the love of God can conquer hardened hearts. The reality is we're all hard. We like to think the other sinners are hard. But we are hard. Just before I came over, I was on the phone with a dear friend of mine who is laboring in the gospel in Baghdad, Iraq. Can you imagine that? In his lovely family. Don't feel sorry for him. They're having the time of their life. He'd just gotten back from a coffee shop having, having coffee with a man who is a seeker, a man trying to 
find the truth from a strong Muslim upbringing and trying to discern who is the true and living God. And my friend, with tears, with tears said, I sat there in that shop and told him the story of the prodigal son. I heard my friend weeping on the phone, weeping. And he said, I explained to him that that father loved that lost boy so much that he did what Eastern men wouldn't do. He forgot all protocol. He forgot what everybody thought about him. And he hiked that Eastern uh, skirt that he wore, that robe up, and he took off running after that boy and threw his arms around him because it was a picture of the love of the Heavenly Father that is perpetually seeking every sinner. Let them be church sinners or let them be worldly sinners, but all are sinners and all need the Father's love. And I started weeping. And I thought to myself, when was the last time I was that moved by the love of God? We say it so flippantly, the love of God. And I said to the Lord, and my friend didn't know what I was preaching tonight, and I said to the Lord, dear Lord, give me that. Conquer my heart again. Do something in me again to cause me to respond as I should to the love of God. We love Him. We love Him because He's always the first cause. He always goes first. We love Him because He first loved us. God didn't say, you love me first. He loved you first. God didn't say, open your door first. He opened His door first. And when you say you love God, this is the way you have to say it. I love you too, Lord. Because he goes first, Paul wrote, the love of Christ constraineth us. Literally, it grabs a hold of us and won't let go of us. I'm going to tell you what's wrong with us. I'm going to tell you why you gotta, why you got to talk people in the church and talk people out of doing certain things and pump people up and prime people up all the time because they've never really been captured by Calvary and consumed by the love of God. You get a clear glimpse of what Jesus did for you and God's heart for you, my friend. You will never be the same again. The Father's love conquers our hearts. There's a second truth I want you to write down, and it is this. The Father's love controls all of our relationships. Uh, now we're getting down to where we live, aren't we? It begins with our relationship with God, of course, but it extends to every part of our life. Let me show you what I mean. Let me show you what I mean. Remember, every verse is connected to all the other verses. It's a progressive revelation. Now back up to verse number 5. This is powerful. Paul said, this is what I want for you, church at Corinth. By the way, I'll remind you, he was talking to church people. Look at verse number 5. Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. <laughs> Pretty strong language to a bunch of church people, I'd say, wouldn't you? He said, excuse me, excuse me. Would you please examine yourself? You better make very sure you have a relationship with God yourself. Well, that's not all he says. Keep reading. It gets even stronger. Look at verse number 7. He said, I pray to God that you do no evil. Not that we should appear approved, but that we should... Do that, you should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. He said, treat us like reprobates and rejects if you want to. He said, but my great prayer for you is that you'll not only know that you're saved, but you'll live like you're saved. The gospel will make that kind of impact in your life. Look at verse number 9. He said, we're glad when you're weak and we're weak and you're strong, and this also we wish even your perfection. And we all understand we're not going to be sinlessly perfect till the day we get our new body and we're with the Lord Jesus and made like unto him. But the word perfect here literally is a word for maturity. I love this progression. He says, I want you to know for sure you're saved. He said, I want you to live like you're saved. And he said, I want your faith to mature. It's pretty all-encompassing, isn't it? Watch this, please. Look at verse 11. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. How many of you think we could use a little of that right now? Here's how it happens. Look at it. And the God of what? Would you circle that in verse number 11 and draw a line down to verse 14, the love of God? Yeah, I love this. In verse 11, you got the God of love, and in verse 14, you got the love of God. That's beautiful, isn't it? The God of love and peace shall be with you. Remember last night we, we learned that God's grace comes first and then peace. Now we find God's love comes first and then peace. God always comes himself and then he brings the peace with him. Do you need peace in your heart? Are you troubled, anxious? I've heard from some people today who are troubled and anxious. 
There are people like that sitting in this room tonight. I have no idea what's vexed you, what's grieving you, what's on your mind, and what's bearing down your heart. But I know this. If you need the peace of God, here's what you need. You need a fresh glimpse of the love of God. Because watch this, please. If you can realize how much God loves you, you will be at peace because you'll know you're in good hands in the hands of an all-loving God. Don't you know if you're in nail-pierced hands tonight, you're in good hands? And if God would not spare his own son, how should he not with him also freely give us all things? What, what is the thing that's troubling you? Is your home disrupted? Is there division and problems in the home? You say, oh, our home's a place of war. We want it to be a place of peace, preacher, but we don't know how to get there. We're trying to make peace. Don't, look, you can't do that on your own. Here's what you need. You need a fresh glimpse of the love of God. And when God begins demonstrating his love to you and you begin loving him and loving others in his power, then, oh, it's glorious. God's love will produce the peace. Sometimes in churches there's war. That probably never happens in this church. I hope it never happens in this church. And it happens. It happens in churches. Somebody said that some churches are more like goat pens and sheep folds because everybody's always butting heads all the time. Well, that shouldn't be. Mr. Moody, the famous evangelist, said one night, the only way any church can get the blessing, listen to this, the only way any church can get the blessing, he said, is if they live in the spirit of the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. And he said, if any church will live in the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, he said, I am sure that many will be added to that church. Do you know why that is? Because Jesus said, by this shall all men know you're my disciples when you have love one for another. Now, you know, you've you got a great crowd of people, and you've got a lot going on here and programs, and I love every bit of it. But I'm going to tell you the one thing this church should always be known for in this community, it should be known as a place where the love of God is present. When people come through the door, they ought to sense the love of God. When they meet you out on the street, they ought to sense the love of God. You know why? Because only the love of God really makes the difference. The love of God controls all the relationships. In fact, did you notice the verses that precede verse number 14? Look at it. Verse 12, greet one another with a holy kiss. Some of you are grateful to God we don't do that anymore, right? It's a very cultural thing. I've been in parts of the world where they still do that. I do like verse number 13, all the saints salute you. May I just make a little application? Excuse me, time out, parenthesis. I think God's people, when they get together, there ought to be such a loving fellowship, such a oneness, that when lost people come in among it, they say, you know, something different here. It just There's something different here. Salute one another. And I don't mean this kind of salute. I mean speak to one another. Encourage one another. Matter of fact, do it now. Turn around and say hello to somebody you haven't seen tonight. Would you please? You say right in the middle of the message, right in the middle of the message. Look up here just for a minute. Look here. You know what happens? I'm going to tell you what happens in churches. I'm in hundreds of churches. You know what happens? People come through the door. Excuse me. And they plop down the same seat they sit in every week next to the same person they sit next to every week and don't speak to anybody else. And if I was a lost person and went to most of those churches, I would never go back and I wouldn't want whatever Christ it was they said they had. And I tell you, you let any church get filled with the love of God, that changes everything because it controls all the relationships. There's a third truth I'd like you to write down, and it is this. There's a progression here. First, it conquers our hearts. Second, it controls our relationships. And third, it changes our world. (laughs) Everybody knows our our world needs a whole lot of changing right now, doesn't it? You remember Jude, Jude 22? It says, if some have compassion, making a difference. The only thing that really makes a difference is the love of God. You can make laws. Laws do not change people's hearts. You can give rules and regulations all you want to. Changes nothing. You might even make a man a moral sinner, but you still made him a sinner. But there's one thing that changes everything. Oh, blessed be the name of our great God. The love of God is the only thing that cuts through all the hatred and harshness and anger in our world. And I want you to know right now, this world is dying to know somebody that has the love of God. You remember in 1 Corinthians 13, it says, Now about three things, what are they? Faith, hope, and charity. That's the love of God. And then it says this. This is really interesting. This always puzzled me for years. It says, And the greatest of these is charity. And I used to think the greatest of these, not faith, not hope, charity, the greatest of these. And I got to ponder on that. Why would that be? Well, one reason is because charity is not a thing. It's a person. God is love, so that's God himself. 
And then it dawned on me. Watch, please. The other two have an end. Love has no end. Faith will end someday, church. I, I hope your faith is in Christ and Christ alone for your soul's salvation. I hope you're trusting God and living the life of faith right now. But I'm, I'm going to tell you tonight, there's coming a day your faith is going to end. Say, so when's it going to end? It's going to end in sight. Isn't that going to be great? And hope, well, it's a great thing to have hope. But someday, hallelujah, hope is going to end in reality. The substance of the thing. But love, mm -mm. no. Matter of fact, let me tell you where you're going to live. Somebody said, I'm going to heaven someday, or I'm, I'm going to whatever someday. Well, fine. Let's, let's debate, you know, you're going to live in the New Jerusalem or wherever. Let me tell you where you're going to live. You're going to live with the God of love. That's where you're going. And you're going to live with the one who is love for all eternity. And I imagine on that day we're going to think, you know, Lord, I really didn't know anything about how much you loved me. I mean, Lord, I, I didn't even have an idea. I studied the Bible all those years. But here's what I know. If some of God's people tonight could get full of the love of God, it may be the one thing that touches other sinners and says to them that the message of the gospel is what they need. And here's what I've been so deeply convicted about. I'm a preacher. My granddaddy was a preacher. <laughs> My daddy's a preacher. My uncles are preachers. Mama did some preaching. It was around the house. You know what I mean by that? I mean, I grew up around it. We were talking about the area that I'm from a while ago. The area that I'm from, I don't know what your area is like. The area I'm from, there's a church on every corner. Everybody's a member of a church. I mean, everybody's a member of a church. Everybody's been baptized two or three times. Everybody's grandma's a preacher. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, everybody has some religious connection. And you know what I'm discovering more and more? That so many of those people have no real relationship with the God of love. I mentioned Dale Moody a few minutes ago. Moody's one of, my, one of my heroes to read after. I've just been so blessed by his ministry. Have, didn't meet him here. He's been in heaven a long time. I'm going to meet him someday, though. Dale Moody was traveling in Europe, and he met a young minister by the name of Henry Morehouse. Morehouse was just a young preacher starting out, but he was a fireball of a preacher, and Moody was impressed with him. And he said, he said young man, he said, if you ever come to the United States, he said, you wire me and let me know. And he said, I'll have you preach in my church in Chicago, what's now the Moody Church in Chicago. A few months went by, and Moody got a message that Morehouse was in the United States, and he sent word and found out was there a time he could come to Chicago, and he said, yes, I could come on these dates, and, and Moody said, mm. he said, I'm going to be out of town in meetings on those dates. He said, but that's all right. Come on. He said, I'll organize the, the meetings for you, and the men of the church will take good care of you, and my wife will be here, and you come on and preach in our church for several nights, and I'll be back at the tail end of the meeting. The appointed day came. Moody was out of town. Morehouse came, and he started the meetings. And he preached one night, he preached two nights, three nights, four nights. And I mean, God was, God was in the place. I mean, the Lord was in the place. Moody arrived home late one night from his meeting, from his trip. It was late in the week. And greeted his wife at home. And, and they chit-chatted for a moment. And, and he said, how are the meetings? How are the meetings at the church? And she started crying. And she said, oh, Dwight. She said, better than ever. May I just tell you, if your pastor's gone, don't say that. Just don't, just don't say that, especially if you're the pastor's wife. You know? And Moody said, well, what's so wonderful about them? He said, I know he's a great young preacher. And she said, that's not it. She said, it's not him. He said, well, what is it? She said, it's what he's been preaching. He said, well, what's he been preaching? She said, John 3.16. He said, well, that's good. That's a great gospel text. He said, what else has he been preaching? She's weeping. She said, that's all. She said, every night, same verse, every night, same thing, every night, the love of God. Moody said, I got to hear this for myself. She said, the amazing thing, Dwight, she said, it's like it's fresh every night. It's, it's not old. It's not stale. It's, it's not a repeat. It's, it's all new. It's all just right there in the verse, but it's all the same thing. It's the love of God. The next evening, Moody showed up at his own church. Walked in the side door. He's a famous evangelist by this time. Walked in the side door, and young Henry Morehouse, uh, just honored that Mr. Moody was there. He said, oh, Mr. Moody, it's so good to see you preach tonight. And Moody said, no, nope, no, nope, I'm not here to preach. I'm here to hear you preach. Moody was a humble man. 
They said that night he took his front and center seat on the front row, the pastor of his own church. Got a notepad out and a pen and his Bible (laughs) and sat there waiting to hear the message. The irony of it was that just above the pulpit where Morehouse would preach that night in big bold letters, Moody had engraved, God is love. Moody would later testify it was the first night in his life he had ever really seen the love of God. Moody said that young Morehouse humbly walked to the pulpit that night and he said, friends, forgive me. Forgive me. He said, I've searched all day for a different text. He said, all day. He said, I've just been embarrassed that I've just taken you to one verse all week. He said, all day I've been looking for a different verse to preach from tonight. And he said, then I had this thought. Even if an angel came down from heaven, I don't think he could find a better verse than for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And D.O. Moody later said, I sat on the front row of my own church and listened as that young man spoke out of the overflow of a heart that had been captured with the love of God. And D.L. Moody said, for the first time in my ministry, I really saw the love of God. And he said, it changed my life. He said, I was never the same. He said, I preached the same scriptures and the same, same text. But he said, now I preached it with a view of the cross. And he said, now I didn't preach God as an angry God. He said, I preach God as the God who is love and who loves sinners like me. I'll tell you what we need, church. We need a fresh glimpse of the Father's love.